Welcome to the life and the love of Rush Creek Christian Church. On this day of Pentecost, we celebrate the breath of the Spirit coming upon the disciples. The Spirit is the ongoing declaration of the risen Christ's presence in His holy body, the Church. And above all, the Spirit is the gift of Jesus sent by the Father. It is the Spirit who guides Jesus' followers into the fullness of truth. friends for a children's sermon. We miss you guys at home. Today, I have brought a birthday cake. So it's for a special birthday. It's not my birthday, and it's not the minister's birthday. It's the birthday of the church. We call it Pentecost. Now, when we celebrate Pentecost at church, we don't generally eat cake, but we do wear sometimes red, and we talk about how the church came to be. If you remember, Jesus died on the cross, and he was resurrected three days later, he came back to life, and he stayed for 40 days on earth with his disciples and his followers, and when he knew it was time to go back to heaven, he gathered his disciples around him, and he told them, after I am gone, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then you can go out to the rest of the world, but you need to wait for this particular gift. So the disciples agreed, and after Jesus left them, they went down to Jerusalem, and they found a house, and they stayed inside, and they waited. 
And of course, waiting is hard when you know something special is going to happen. And waiting is probably also even harder when you're not really sure what it means that the Holy Spirit is going to come. But on the 10th day, there was a great rushing wind that came through their house. And one of the amazing things was that there were, the Bible tells us, tongues of fire that came down and stayed over the disciples' heads. So we're pretending these are tongues of fire and these are our disciples. Now these were not types of fire that would burn you. The fire was really a sign that the Holy Spirit had come from heaven and had come into the disciples. And this Holy Spirit allowed the disciples to speak in many different languages. So in Jerusalem, there were lots of people visiting and they spoke all kinds of different dialects and languages and they heard these uh, disciples speaking their tongues and they couldn't believe it. How do they know how to speak my language? Well, that was the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with thousands of people. They were able to reach these people because God made it possible. So all those people that became Christians, they took a bit of that Holy Spirit with them in their hearts. And when they left and returned home and the disciples went out, they spread the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world. And so this is why we call this the birthday of the Christian church. So if we were going to wish the church a happy birthday, we could do it in different languages. If you know some Spanish, you might say, Feliz cumpleaños. If you know some French, you might say, Heureux anniversaire. And if you know some German, this is longer. Herzlichen Glückwunsch zum Geburtstag. Those are all the ways of saying happy birthday. So let's finish with a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for Pentecost, for the birthday of the church, and thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to us. Thank you for helping us to live the way you want us to live. We love you. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Spirit of God, O oh Holy Spirit, fall upon us, fill us with your strength, with your joy, with your desires. May we be people who have language to speak to those who need to hear your good word. May we be people who have the courage to stand and be ridiculed when we are preparing the way for your word. Give us, O oh Holy Spirit, the words to speak, the wisdom to see your path within the paths that we see in this world. O oh Holy Spirit, come. Come and remind us of the good, good news of Jesus, of the good, good news of how you have conquered death and that there is nothing for us to fear. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Come and open up the scriptures to us that we may find your word within our holy scriptures. Oh, Holy Spirit, come and give us the ability to, as your first church did, to take care of one another, to seek out those who are in need and share what we have with them 
and to gather together in whatever way we can and share in fellowship and share in talking of you and the great hope that you have brought to the whole world. On this day of Pentecost, when we remember the start of your church, may we be church to all of those we encounter in whatever ways we encounter. And may we see the new ways that you're opening up as you always have, because you are the one who redeems creation. You are the one who sustains us. And you are the one who gives us everything that we need. And so, Lord, we come as your servants and pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. First of all, let me say how much I have missed seeing all of you. But in my mind's eye, I'm looking out and seeing you today. We're reading today about Pentecost, taken from Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Both others, uh, but others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer together. O God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So to start out, I want to give this scripture that was just read a little context. See, this story comes very soon after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. The disciples are left all alone, and the last thing that Jesus tells them is to wait for the Spirit to join them. He does not tell them when or how this will happen. So the story starts with a sense of 
helplessness and waiting. Sure, they witnessed Jesus raised from the dead, but then he left. They do not know what is to come of his ministry, what he preached, or what will, to, what will happen with the world. They don't even know if there are still people searching or for followers of Jesus to crucify them. They don't know if they are in danger or safe. Thankfully, it doesn't seem in the scriptures like they have to wait very long. The Holy Spirit comes to them, not in the still silence, but in the roaring, rushing wind. This indescribable story very quickly reveals God's will for the disciples and the church as they are given the ability to speak the languages of everyone around them. Through, through the Spirit, the disciples were given the, good, the command and the ability to spread the good news and grow the church to everyone they could. The message of Jesus was not just for the Jews in Jerusalem. It wasn't even just for the Jews throughout the world and all these regions, but it was for everyone, regardless of race, religion, or social status. But I want to take a moment and, and go even bigger. See, the contents, the context of this scripture is bigger than what was immediately happening with these disciples. This story is profound in the larger story of scripture and the larger story of God in relationship with creation. See, this act of the Holy Spirit is a pretty stunning reversal of the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. See, in Genesis, God scatters the people and makes them speak all kinds of different languages so they cannot understand each other as one unified people. But here with the disciples, thousands of years later on the day of Pentecost, this has been undone. Here we see God acting to take nations of divided people and unite them back together again. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself talking about this big picture stuff, so I'm going to take that, I'm gonna, I want us to put that on a shelf for just a moment. And, and for just a moment I want to talk about one of the ways that I was taught to communicate in school. In my senior year of high school, I joined the debate team, and I was very good at debate, very quickly too. See, if you don't know anything about high school competitive debate, let me tell you a little bit of, of what that's about. Um, when you set up to the stage, it's you and another person and a judge. That's almost always the only people in the room. Uh, before you ever get there, months in advance, you're everybody, all competitive debaters are given the same topic, and you are tasked with um, building your case um, for both sides of the topic, for both the affirmative and the negative, and so you don't know which one you're going to argue until right before you enter that room. Once you're in that room, each of you takes turns talking one after the other, and it is hard to understand. You are, you are on a time limit, so you have to cram as much material as possible, as much evidence in your case as possible to build the strongest case. And so you get talking very, 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 very fast. Um, and when you're listening, when the, your opponent's talking, you're writing and jotting down notes as quickly and as fastly as you possibly, possibly can. It is incredibly difficult to keep up. But when you're listening to the other person and jotting notes, you don't care about where they're coming from. You don't care about their position, well, because you know that they don't necessarily care about their position either. They have one position for each side. You're only listening to be able to deconstruct their arguments when it's your turn. You're not listening to understand each other. The goal of this whole exercise isn't to convince one person of one thing. The goal is to win. It is a competition after all. See, this way of communicating that I did so well uh, my senior year of high school 
or not really communicating, reminds me a lot of what I see online every single day. On every social media imaginable, I see vicious debates online about politics, religion, or whatever just the current subject is. What color is that dress? People furiously typing at each other with only the desire to be heard rather than to hear. The goal of these arguments is always to win rather than authentically communicate. And when they inevitably end in stalemate, they often turn to vicious personal attacks. I'm sure I'm not the only one to have witnessed this. We all see it every single day, and if we are all honest with ourselves, we participate in some kind of way. Even if you do not actively get into arguments in the comments section of the latest shared article, I'm willing to bet you are surrounding yourself with people who understand the world just like you. This creates the same dynamic that feeds our lack of understanding of other people. It seems like every day we move further apart as wider divisions grow among us. But wasn't the internet supposed to bring everyone together? At least that's what we were promised. Here we have this miracle of technology that connects people from every continent and every country. It accumulates all of the knowledge and ideas of the whole world. By its very design, it is a network of connection. Then how is it that this tool has done more to sow division and build walls between us? Somehow it has done more to exacerbate our differences rather than amplify our shared experiences. We thought the internet would bring us together, but it has turned into our modern day Tower of Babel. We have all been scattered into speaking different languages. Some of us speak Republican while others speak Democrat. Some speak conservative while others speak progressive. Many don't speak any of those languages at all. Some of us speak Christian or Muslim or Jew while others speak a completely different language of spirituality. Many around us are speaking completely different racial languages. Some of us speak Euro-American while our neighbors speak African-American. You can find all these languages and many more just among those who claim to speak the same language of English. Even if our grammar and vocabulary seem the same, we cannot seem to understand each other. So on this day, on this day of Pentecost, I challenge us to change that. We can no longer speak without listening. This comes out of the same selfish pride that we find at the Tower of Babel. It is the reflection of the absence of the Holy Spirit. If we are to allow the Holy Spirit to enter into this time like a rushing wind and move between us, we have to see each other and hear each other like the Holy Spirit sees and hears us. Every person, regardless of their identity and regardless of our judgments about them, is a beloved child of God. Peter tells us clearly that the Holy Spirit does not just speak through the select few, but through all, peop all people. So if the Holy Spirit is moving through those so different than me, how am I supposed to hear them speaking in, a, in this completely different language? I am fluent in the languages of Southern, white, and Christian cultures. I am fluent in the languages of wealth and comfort. So how am I supposed to hear the voice of the oppressed? In our scripture, the Holy Spirit allowed for the understanding for both the speakers and the listeners. 
It is unclear if the disciples were literally able to speak other languages or if the crowd miraculously was able to hear them in their own language, no matter where they were from. The important part is that the Spirit brought them together. So I, even with my native languages, must listen to those who are so different than me, not to understand their words so that I can come up with an appropriate counterpoint, but actually listen to who they are and their life experiences. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do, I would say impossible thing to do, as it is so easy for our judgments to creep in and cause us to not hear the languages of others. It's so easy for us to think about our next reply, which would just build up our walls and defenses between us and the other person. I firmly believe that we cannot do this task alone. We cannot join together and hear the languages that we do not, do not speak without the power of the Holy Spirit. Without that, we will simply just continue to speak these other languages and continue to be divided. But once we are able to hear, once we have the humility to allow the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit in and truly listen to those, I mean truly listen with the Spirit and see the humanity in others, then and only then will the Holy Spirit come in like a rushing wind and give us the power to speak for ourselves, give us the power to work for mercy and for justice. Amen. In 1943, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in prison in Berlin when Pentecost came to be. In Europe, it was called Whitsunday. And so he wrote a letter to his family. He started it on that Sunday and he finished it on Monday. And in that letter, he said, well, Whitsuntide is here and we are still separated but it is in a special way, a feast of fellowship. When the bells rang this morning, I longed to go to church, but instead I did as John did on the island of Patmos and had such a splendid service of my own that I did not feel lonely at all, for you were all with me, every one of you. It is now Whit Monday, and I am just sitting down to a dinner of turnips and potatoes when your partial parcel that Rudiger brought as a Whitsuntide present arrived quite unexpectedly. I really, really cannot tell you what happiness such things give one. However certain I am of the spiritual bond between all of you and myself, the spirit always seemed to want some visible token of this union of love and remembrance. And then material things become the vehicle of spiritual realities. I think this is analogous to the need felt in all religions for the visible appearance of the Spirit in the sacrament. I think we long for that in this time. We long for it always, but we really feel it now. We long that these, these elements this bread that represents body, this juice that represents blood, those themselves, just the elements of a life and a life for us. And on this day of Pentecost, as we gather together, it leaps my heart to know that I share these elements, these visible symbols of a great love with all of you. And most importantly, that we all celebrate that love with God. Would you please join me in prayer? Loving God, pour out your spirit to make the elements come alive for us. Make this meal awaken our sleepy hearts and stagnant souls. 
May this time of eating and drinking be one where we stir from our sadness and rise from our hopelessness. As we share this meal, let us remember our siblings in faith who came to this table in decades and centuries past and our children who will surround this table in the future. On this Pentecost, let us celebrate the spirit of resurrection and the promise of a needed second wind in our lives. Holy Spirit, come and make this bread and wine to be the body of Jesus and the cup of salvation for us. Open our hearts to receive this special meal so that we might be holy and good and free now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 